the Northern Arizona Peer and Family Coalition, and Nami Yavapai present Mental Health Monday, The Impact of Trauma. Our presenter today is Dawn McReynolds. She is the administrator of the OIFA office at United Healthcare. I want to welcome everyone to the um, Mental Health Monday. Um, the subject for today is the impact and trauma. And I think we all recognize that trauma plays a major role in our life. And it's how we respond or get treatment um, to trauma as to how it manifests itself. For some of us, we live with it for the rest of our life, but others um, can more easily go on. So today, this, this production is put on by Nami Yakupai and Northern Arizona Peer and Family Coalition. <laughs> so thank you, Lori. And then we've got Candy in the background. And so well, um, as far as the, the format for today, it's a little bit different. Don has agreed to be taking questions as she's speaking. So Don, do you want them to just raise their hand or go into chat or how do you want to do that? Yeah, they could just raise their hand. Okay, so I will introduce the, uh, the topic for today. Have you or your loved one experienced trauma? What do you know about trauma? Don McReynolds is going to speak from an informative meeting to discuss trauma basics and how COVID has, has increased trauma for many. Don is originally from Detroit, Michigan, where she transitioned from working for a nonprofit organization to a founding one in 2003. She brings her personal experience and deep understanding of receiving services in, in the behavioral health system as a member, as all she does. Don leads the, the United Healthcare Community Plans, OIFA, Office of Individual and Family Affairs team. This team, OIFA teams, works collectively, co co collaboratively, um, with lived experience members and family members to gather the voice and experience of our community in order to enhance, improve, and remo remove barriers to services from all that they serve. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Dawn, and we'll see what she has to present. Okay. Thanks, um, everyone, for being here. Um, first, I want to say that I am not a clinical individual. I am an individual with, as Kathy indicated, lived experience, which means that I have either navigated um, the behavioral health system, or I'm a family member that has a loved one that has navigated the behavioral health system. So for today's topic, um, please keep in mind that this information that is being shared is for your benefit. However, it is not a clinical point of view. It's rather a lived experience point of view. And I will be going over some mind-body connections and some information about how trauma forms within our mind from our experiences. So let's go on this journey of learning together. Um, as Kathy and, and Candy and Lori indicated, I am um, a firm believer that we learn more by communicating with one another. So rather than um, you know, saving all the questions to the end, go ahead and raise your hand and let's have a conversation. Okay, so let me get my driver here where I can see the slides. Let's go into just some information about trauma basics. Um, there are a lot of definitions that you will find um, on the internet, within clinical teams, within the behavioral health system as a whole of what does trauma mean. Basically, I've defined it as it's an emotional shock that overwhelms our abilities and creates a response within us. And oftentimes we can define those responses as a fight response, a flight response, a freeze response. 
And just recently, within the last five years, they've defined what's called a fawn response. We will definitely get back in to these responses on the next slide, but for this conversation, trauma is defined by how you define it. So if you've experienced trauma in your past, you have your own definition of what trauma means to you. And I'm not here to change that. Um, let's look at the responses that we sometimes have when we experience trauma. Up in the upper left-hand corner, you'll see that some individuals fight when they become re-traumatized or experience trauma. So it's kind of a self-preservation at all costs. Um, they may have explosive tempers. They are unable to hear other people's point of view. Sometimes these individuals are referred to as bullies. Um, sometimes individuals that are, have experienced trauma are in, in that fight response, demand perfection from others. But we can see when trauma is the um, underlying response that this fight response that others have really is their way of reacting and coping with their trauma. Over in the right-hand corner, you'll see the flight response that I'm not going to read everything, but you could see that sometimes individuals have a feeling of panic and anxiety, maybe over worrying. Um, some individuals actually work long hours, um, several days, very rarely take days off. And some of that response is due to their need to escape that initial trauma. Please remember, I am not a clinic clinician. So these are learned behaviors that um, appear within our community with individuals who have responses. Down in the lower left in the yellow, it may look kind of light orangish on your screen, is the freeze response. A deer in headlights comes into mind when we're talking about individuals that have experienced trauma, they freeze. Um, sometimes they will isolate themselves from others in the outside world. Um, kind of a feeling of hibernation may occur, brain fog difficulty in making decisions, um, even acting on decisions and owning those decisions is difficult for individuals who have that freeze response. And I don't know, by show of hands, how many of you have heard of the fawn response? Nobody. Okay, this is an interesting, okay, a couple. Thanks, Veronica. Hi, Veronica. <laughs> um, a few people have. Fawn response is a response that's bred out of people pleasing, that kind of, I want to make everything better. I want to make everything nice. Um, individuals fall within any one of these four categories, but the fawn response is, let me help you. They're known as individuals that are kind of angels of mercy. They will go above and beyond. Um, they will not say no. They have a very difficult time in standing up for themselves. Um, they're really concerned about what others think of them, um, maybe overly concerned about, um, you know, their social standing, um, individuals accepting them, and so forth. One thing to note about all four of these um, responses to trauma is that some individuals, and actually a lot of us, maneuver through any one of these given the circumstances. Um, so we can have a road that we normally respond to, and then sometimes depending on the circumstance, we can freeze or, or, or flight, you know, whatever that response may be. So let's look at the next slide. Um, so one of the things that we want to remember is that trauma is not necessarily a mixture of a ton of events. It can actually be one single event. Um, or a set 
of ongoing circumstances that can overwhelm an individual. And that's why Dr. Miller um, in 2013, his, um, his write-up was called a failure um, to recover. So you can see by the title of that, he focuses a lot on that freeze response that we talked about. Um, but also remember that trauma is subjective and it's, it's actually considered a adverse psychological response to any given situation. So what does all that mean? All those big words mean? It really means that trauma is based on the circumstance. And it also really means that the response is indicative of someone that is having one of those four reactions to trauma. Um, so it can psychologically, um, you know, uh, hurt that person if they re-experience trauma again and again. And another addition to this is that it is not the actual event that defines trauma. So I was in the middle of the road and there was a car accident right in front of me. Sometimes we define trauma based on what we see and the event. That's not necessarily true. With trauma, two people can have been in that middle of that road and saw that accident and have completely different responses or feelings about it. So the actual event doesn't define the trauma. Our response to the event defines the trauma. Any questions or comments because I can't see um, the audience? I'd like to add one thing to that, that I think a lot of people think that they're really strong. And just like you said, you know, one individual may break down, the other just goes on like nothing happened. And a lot of that has to do with your educational response, your maturity, um, prior response. We know the guys that were captured in Vietnam, that the ones that had higher rank um, and more education came home and did did much better. So so I just wanted to add that little piece. It's exactly what you're saying, Don, but give an example of it. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. And I think another thing that's really important is that if you have experienced trauma, to try not to pigeon your whole yourself, um, pigeonhole yourself into a certain lane. And and the reason I always recommend that is that sometimes we move into a hopelessness if we cannot um, process through trauma or we compare ourselves to others. And so we're all unique individuals, and our responses are unique to who we are. It's not bad or good. Good, rather it's uniqueness at, that drives our ability to go through the trauma that we've experienced. Um, I did want to give you some information and um, this will be PDF'd and sent to um, Lori and Kathy and Candy so that if somebody requests this, this presentation, they can have a copy of it. But um, up here in the upper left, you'll see the words reenactment. Um, this is a very typical response to trauma, and like I said, not everybody's the same, but a lot of people actually have repeat some childhood dynamics where trauma has entered their life during their childhood experiences, and they expect um, the same result of that situation that they got when they were younger, that they experienced when they were children, but they're really internally hoping for a different response. And so this strategy of I'm still going to, let's use an example, I'm going to look for someone that can become my best friend. And every time growing up when I, when I tried to bond to an individual, you know, I got hurt and, you know, that's still the case now. I'm, you know, an adult and um, still getting hurt. Um, so that strategy of using the same information from 
a child that's been traumatized and then putting that into our adult behavior um, most often fails because we are already predetermining the outcome before we even move into um, the action. So because the past really cannot be resolved when we're still pulling it into our current life. Um, so also, um, you will interpret anything that that new individual does in the case of wanting a best friend as confirmation. See, they've already betrayed me. They didn't return my call. They didn't answer my text. They, you know, went out to lunch with someone else. So those type of preconceived childhood traumas of of, of, you know, being let down or abandoned by others carry through that adulthood. So reenacting them helps us fail at being able to make that bond um, in, in the um, example that I've given. The other result um, that a lot of individuals carry into adulthood is shame. So children may grow up into an adult that can never be wrong um, because being wrong is a trigger to being shamed. And so I don't know if anybody on this call has ever experienced either themselves behaving that way or somebody else, but everything is outside of them. Everything is everybody else's fault. Well, wouldn't it be helpful if we knew that trauma was um, creating that behavior in someone? How much would our empathy increase if we understood that they feel shamed when they make a mistake. And so when we're relating to one another in our community and we see this type of behavior, maybe we can take a step back and, and ask ourselves, you know, why is this person not able to apologize or be wrong? Maybe there's a bigger issue, you know, that's happening here than we know. Um, and then also we have to remember with trauma, and we're going to talk about the brain chemistry here in a little bit, but, and I probably will say this a hundred times through this presentation. Again, I am not a clinician. Um, however, uh, there are danger cues that our brain gets when we start feeling that something is dangerous and trauma is coming um, our way. And over a period of time, sometimes we lose the, the ability to hear those cues and actually respond to those cues. So um, how do you know when, what is dangerous when someone you trust hurts you and you're traumatized over and over and over again and that becomes the normal? So imagine if you don't have those danger cues early in dangerous situations, what can occur to you and your safety? So Veronica Welch has raised her hand. Okay. Hi, Hi Veronica. Hi, Don. This is a great presentation. I um I just it's not really a question that I have, but I think it's a really powerful learning, um, a learning experience because when we when we meet with people um in the public and in the communities, and you know, initially it comes across like, whoa, where is this, where is this coming from? Um, we, we initially probably see anger or frustration, but really what's underneath all of that is, is not anger and frustration. It's, it's trauma-based, it's fear-based. It's, um, it, people have that, that, that protection, right? They want to protect themselves. And sometimes the way to protect themselves is to immediately come out as like, um, I will hurt you before you hurt me type of thing. But right. if we, yeah, if we can step back and look past that, usually what's underneath all of that is number one, they want to be heard. Number two, they want to be validated. You don't always have to agree, but you need to validate. And, and number three, to understand that, yes, more than likely this is trauma based and that they they really are struggling to just want to share this information with you in a way that's going to be accepted and they won't be shamed. So this, I love this presentation. This is the first time I've seen this type of slide and I think it's fabulous. So thank you. 
Oh, thank you. And I appreciate your feedback, Veronica. Um, and, and I think you're so right. As a peer and all of you as peers and family members, you know, one of the th questions that we can help ourselves and help others is if we pause and say, what is really going on here? If we just pause before we respond as Veronica indicated. Okay, I'm gonna go to the next slide. Um, so what is the mind-body connection with regard to trauma and why we respond the way that we do and what occurs? Um, so we have, Essentially, I mean, obviously we have a ton of information in our in our brain, but essentially we have what's called the amygdala and the amygdala acts as that alarm that I was referring to in the previous slide when I said sometimes over a period of time when we're when we're hurt and we're traumatized, we no longer pick up on those alarm cues. And so over a period of time of experiencing trauma, um, the amygdala does a couple things. Um, it helps us go, uh oh, something's wrong. Uh, this feels familiar. This doesn't feel good. And then we get into those kind of responses that we talked about with the fight, flight, freeze, fawn response. Um, however, we have to remember that the amygdala doesn't say, okay, this feeling that's coming in isn't really dangerous. So I'm going to file that to just a warning, be on alert, kind of yellow light type of response, but this is very dangerous. So our amygdala does not have the ability to distinguish between, is this a real threat? Um, or is this a previous experience that we've encountered and our brain is feeling very similar and heightened because of it? So you'll see here on your screen that little red dot, that's where the amygdala lives. And then that blue kind of looks like a smile, I guess, depending on where you're at today, um, is called our hippocampus. And that really helps us store um, information, just like a library when you go in. And well, in the old days, and this, I'm I guess I'm going to age myself, when you go in and pull the drawer out and look through the index cards to find a book, this hippocampus does the same, very same thing. So it will take you through a process of filing, um, you know, different memories and so forth. However, when our threat system is activated, the hippocampus doesn't work so well. It cannot, um, it can forget to actually say, well, this was a trauma memory. So I'm gonna label that as a tra trauma memory and put it where it belongs. So sometimes information gets stored into the wrong place and we remember that information as if it's happening at this moment. So in this next slide, remember this about the amygdala being our alarm center and the hippocampus sometimes mislabeling information because this is a really big connection for you to be able to see the cycle that occurs because of that. So, you know, we're, we're having thoughts and images that remind us of a previous trauma. That trauma may not have been stored in our minds as a past trauma. So suddenly we're feeling those, those feelings were maybe anxiety, maybe terror, anger, maybe even physical sensations um, based on the trauma that we experienced. Next thing we know, we move into a behavior. So we try to avoid the triggers or the feelings that we're having. We may freeze, we may run, we may actually fight those feelings. And then suddenly we're able to work through it. There's a short term relief until it starts again, until the next time. And from all of this, we're thinking, wow, okay, my thoughts move into my feelings. That affects my behavior. Then I work through it and I have a momentary relief. But the truth is, is this all happens 
in less than five seconds within our bodies. So trauma thoughts and feelings and behaviors can happen very quickly before we even uh, register how we're responding or what's happening within ourselves. So this is really important information for you to connect these three slides, right? So the very first thing is that we learned about the brain and, and our alarm system and our filing system within our brain. Um, and then we learned about a cycle that occurs. Well, what can set those off? It's what we call triggers. Um, and triggers are a memory tape or a flashback that's transporting the individual who's experiencing that trigger right back to the moment of their original trauma. Uh, example, so, you know, uh, you're at a party one year, it's a Christmas party and Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer song is on and it's playing loud and, and something occurs and someone, um, you know, leaves the party and gets into an accident of some sort. Um, the next year, you're at another Christmas party, just having fun, and Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer comes on the song, and suddenly you're transported back into the previous year and what had occurred. And so re re the, the biggest part of this process is a memory tape or flashback that that recognizing that person is in that event and and that original trauma and that trauma can affect the smell the sight the sound the touch you know if the individual was eating mashed potatoes and gravy at the time of the original trauma you know that taste can can come back into their taste buds and they can experience it so trauma definitely affects us all in different ways but remember that internal trauma things that you feel and experience within your body your thoughts your memories your emotions the sensation may not be known necessarily to you as an individual. You may be saying to yourself, what's happening? I don't feel comfortable. Um, <laughs> you know, something's going on. All of a sudden, I'm having these responses that I'm not aware of. So taking a step back is always taking a few deep breaths and trying to assess what you're really feeling and thinking and experience can help you identify that you're actually reliving and having a trigger. Um, remember that external, you have internal triggers, those that I've just already mentioned, which are those body, those thoughts, emotions, um, body sensations, but you also have external triggers. So you could be with an individual that something had occurred and, and they may say something or a behavior um, that they commonly have that has triggered you in the past um, may present itself and, and suddenly you're back in a spot where you were traumatized. Um, also places you know, you're at a fairground, something awful happened when you were a child at a fairgrounds, and next thing you know, you're feeling, you know, um, sensations and thoughts and not feeling comfortable. So things, I guess the, the point of this slide and the previous two slides is for you to become aware how powerful our minds are and how insidious trauma can be when, when um, we do not get the help that we need and, um, and, and seek out professional support in trying to learn how to heal from trauma one of the most important things we could do for ourselves is acknowledge that we need help and reach out for help. There's a different type of trauma that I'm going to introduce. So we talked about internal, external. I'd like to talk a little bit about generational trauma. <clears throat> 
Now, things happen that we have no control over. In this slide, you'll see a little bit of information about generational trauma and how that actually can affect us today or even our children. So you'll see here the, on the left, you'll see the grandparents, um, the partition of India in 1947, Liberation War in Bangladesh, oppression, domestic violence, abuse, PTSD, patriarchy, um, uh, society, you'll see dependence, chemical dependency, and extreme poverty were all the issues that the grandparents had faced. In this next generation, in our example, is that you'll see that the children of the grandparents um, also faced a lot of trauma, and they experienced alcoholism, physical abuse, repression, anger, emotional abuse, and then you'll see the effect on their children today, which is I need to seek approval. I, I'm not sure about my ide identity. Sometimes eating disorders are, are, you know, experienced from generational trauma, depression, anxiety. So basically what you hear um, on the slide from Nisha Moody um, is one of the articles um, that deals with intergenerational trauma appeared first in 1996 um, from a Canadian psychiatrist called Vivian M. Rakoff. Um, and the colleagues documented high rates of psychological distress um, amongst the children of Holocaust survivors. And really that experienced birth the research in, gosh, you know, if that occurred in the children of the Holocaust survivors, we're not there, but they're experiencing this trauma. How did that, how does that work? And so um, if you're, if you're wondering how the trauma of your parents may have affected you or your grandparents, or you know someone who has generational trauma, you know, one of the things that I always recommend, as you know, I recommend two things, uh, getting professional help and always reaching out to your peer and your family supports for that lived uh, experience component. So reach out, reach out, reach out. Um, <laughs> so let's take a pause here while we begin to talk about the adverse childhood experiences known as ACEs. John, this is Lori. Before we go into ACEs, which I'm, I'm glad you're bringing it up, but the generational trauma, if we could go back to that for a minute. Um, I wonder <coughs> if, if anybody um, wants to um, elaborate on that. I know with, um, for example, this is a great example that you brought up here. Um, but in Northern Arizona, we have a lot of uh, Native American and uh, generational trauma from boarding schools. Um, and I just wanted to bring that up. And I don't know if anybody else wants to bring up any other kind of examples, because this is something that is very, um, uh, well, I don't know what to say. It's not something that people just automatically go to and say, oh, yeah, generational trauma. But there's more of it than we would recognize, I think, is maybe what I'm saying. Well, just, that's what, oh, go ahead. Who, oh, who thank you, that? Dawn. It's Mary. I was just going to mention um, those of us who are in the age cohort where our parents went through the Depression era. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, you know, and I've never honestly thought about that before, but my mother certainly grew up during the Depression and mm -hmm. I, you know, I certainly noticed, noticed at the time that it affected her in ways where she was very frugal and, you know, always rewatched the aluminum foil and, you know, some of, right. some of those kinds of things, but it's, right. it, it certainly goes deeper than that. It does. It does. And one of the most interesting things that we've connected, and I, I don't know who this was that put something in the chat, um, Tyrus? Um, about when we were talking about shame is one of the things that we found um, in, in sharing this information with the others is that there's almost a shame component as well with the generational trauma that's passed down because what occurs is in some cases, like we see here, we have alcoholism that's been experienced by the parents or the children of the 
grandparents. And so then the next generation, even though they may not be experiencing alcoholism, there is a shame that's associated with their parents' stance. And so, of course, there's all these different dynamics that we could really delve into, but I would recommend that you, you know, um, you know, delve into that with professional help unless you are a professional and do your own research. I also believe in self-education. So um, you could do a lot of research on trauma and generational trauma um, that online as well and educate yourself. So let's, Lori, are we able to go to the next slide now? <clears throat> yeah, I think that uh, just that uh, Veronica mentioned that uh, poverty is another generational trauma. Yes, yes. Thank you, Veronica. So we're going to talk about adverse childhood experiences. Most often, a lot of individuals kind of just refer to it as ACEs. But when we just look at the name, um, adverse childhood experiences, we can see that sometimes, um, most often, all the time, those are stressful and traumatic events. They can include various different abuses, um, including neglect. So we want to be mindful of how does the adverse childhood experience that I've experienced affect my behavior, my relationships, and how I am today. Um, so ACEs really do impact um, individuals socially, emotionally. Remember, um, we talked about the development of the amygdala and the hippocampus. Well, when children experience um, trauma, you know, that can also um, affect the brain development in early childhood. So, um, there's, uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of studies on that, but if you want more information, obviously you could talk to your pediatricians or mental health, um, you know, providers to find out what information they have. But adverse childhood experiences have really been linked to risky health behaviors. They've been linked to chronic health conditions, um, uh, low life potential, which really means, you know, how does an individual thrive? They've all, also been linked to um, early death. So this is a impactful stuff folks okay this really meets us where where we are and um, looking at how trauma has impacted us and our lives and continues to impact us is one of the first steps to be able to change just quickly I want to Don, touch we have a question uh, yeah I'm sorry Don on the uh, on the on the slide before this one okay where it says, I'll go back just a moment. Chronic, there we go. Uh, uh, chronic health conditions. I hadn't really thought about that. It makes a lot of sense. Um, but um, can you give any examples of those chronic conditions? Um. Well, like I said, I'm I'm not a, a doctor, so I wouldn't be able to classify okay. like what. But okay, go ahead. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, Don. So there's another um, chart, and I guess you're not using that, but it shows the correlation, a very high correlation between the level of trauma. In other words, if you have a parent that's been divorced, in prison, and so they give you a score, and that score is very highly related to heart disease, to cancer, you know, and it's just phenomenal, the, the relation. So that might be a slide. If you don't have it in here, you can add it. I have a slide that does show the progression of if the numbers increase, what occurs based on, you know, populations, but I did want to stay away from medical diagnoses, like what could occur just because of me not being a well, physician. That's, and, you know, that's very powerful, Dom, because the thing that the ACE study has always concerned me is the, the it, it dashes hope in a sense and reduces some people to a sense of hopelessness. They see they see that score and they say, "Well, I'm just destined," you know. Right. And so we have to have the tools to dig our way out of that. And you know, most people don't end up um, as right. 
the score would predict. That's right. That's right. Okay, was that the only question? So I can move to this next slide. Um, again, this is just a sample of that pyramid of risks. And I try to stay away from the, like I said, those physical um, diagnosis or concrete diagnosis of individuals based on ACEs only because of you know, obviously not being a clinician or a physician, I don't feel it's appropriate for me. Um, but also, Kathy just said um, a huge comment, and this is one of the main reasons that I stay away from anything that <clears throat> other individuals may view as concrete um, in somebody's life, is that we all have to have hope and powerful, um, you know, counseling and community and, um, you know, positive relationships can turn things around regardless of what you've experienced. So given education and support. So I believe in recovery for all individuals as a person with lived experience, that's been my experience. And, and I believe recovery from, you know, health conditions, and physical health diagnosis as well as mental health diagnosis is uniquely defined by the individual who's experiencing it. So for me to, um, you know, say, well, if your number is X, Y, and Z on this screen, then, you know, you're going to experience this or that. That would be inappropriate for me. I don't approach um, my presentations like that because I don't approach my life like that. So um, <clears throat> example of that would be, um, I worked on a longitudinal research project between the relationship of childhood trauma and or parental death and child psychopathology. And what we found is that there was one important person, a teacher, a grandparent, that the re if that child had that relationship, it protected them for, from pathology in later life. One wow. relationship. That's amazing. That's amazing. Um, so here are some examples. And as I said, I don't present these in a concrete fashion where if your score is a zero on ACEs, then only one out of 16 individuals will end up smoking or only one out of 69 will become an alcoholic. These are, these are generalizations and we all know how our community feels about those. However, this is statistical information. So wanted to present just the idea of what occurs, not necessarily the verbiage or, you know, somebody is, you know, destined to, but you can see if they start out with the zero and then another individual has a three, how many um, individuals then do become smokers? So it, it actually increases in our first, you know, with zero ACEs, we see one in 16, um, with just three, ACEs, we see one in six individuals. Um, you know, here again, we see one in 69 individuals possibly becoming alcoholics when their score is a zero. And then when it just increases to three, suddenly we see one in six. Six. <laughs> it, it really is alarming, the concept. So try to keep yourself into broad thinking conceptually trauma in childhood, adverse childhood experiences can or may expose us to this danger of, you know, using drugs or becoming an alcoholic, okay? Now, <clears throat> so we go from three to seven, and how do those numbers affect us? Well, uh, you know, we have information on, you know, one and I think these two are reversed, actually. Sorry about that. So one in every 30, you know, becomes an IV, you know, drug user. So it's definitely impacting um, individuals. And it's, you know, sometimes after all this information, we think, well, you know, gosh, how can we change? Trust and believe. 
anyone can change with the right support and the right goal. So we're not going to have somebody who, you know, may not be able to make changes within themselves. We're not going to set them up with our perceived goals and what our recovery should be. We're going to create that recovery journey based on who they are as an individual and what their goals are. So what are some principles that we can use to be able to help ourselves through the process of becoming not only trauma-informed, but helping ourselves? And please, I always say this to everybody, um, most of us really do have experienced trauma in one form or another most of society has. Before you become some, an individual where you're trying to support others or help others, please ensure that you've done your own internal work, that you've moved into your recovery. And if you think you're completely healed and you're through it, try to revisit that at least every six months. Everybody that's experienced trauma can be triggered by the trauma and it is a healing journey. It's not a sprint. It doesn't happen very fast and it doesn't happen suddenly, okay? <clears throat> These are the basic four R's of trauma-informed care. One, realize, what does that mean? <laughs> it means that we're not alone. It means that we can realize the widespread impact of trauma. It also means, remember earlier, we talked about taking that pause. If somebody's reaction is hurtful or they're unable to apologize or they're, they cannot see their own wrongs, take that pause within ourselves and realize maybe there's more going on here. Maybe there's some trauma. Also, Respond. Respond by fully accepting one another. It's very hard to do. And those of us who work in this industry know day in and day out that we are, you know, interacting with individuals who need our support. But our healing goes beyond that. That goes into our own lives, our real lives. And so responding to our loved ones, our friends, our children, our families, our um with understanding and acceptance, um, integrating the, the kindness and patience that is needed to help individuals take those steps to healing themselves and um, allowing us to support them through that healing journey. Um, also recognize the signs and symptoms. We talked about freeze, flight, fawn, you know, um, fight. We talked about some of those common traits. Um, when I send this out, you'll be able to see those traits a little bit closer. And I challenge you, while you're reading those traits to pause for a moment and think, you know, have I responded this way? Is this something that's going on with me before you start thinking of others? <laughs> okay, that's a challenge. Um, also, seek to resist re-traumatizing others. It's very difficult to not re-traumatize somebody else. However, if we respond realize, respond, and recognize, we lessen the chance that we'll actually re-traumatize others. So let's take a little bit deeper dive, um, realize the trauma. So ACEs has a lasting effect on our health, sometimes negative effect, most often negative. Um, also, it can have an impact on our well-being and the opportunities and how we see opportunities in our lives. Um, toxic stress can change the brain development of children. It can impact their brain development. Now, to get further into that, I'd recommend that you talk with a pediatrician to find out how that can occur or, you know, what you should do to try to create a, a healthy learning environment for your children. But um, we know that some of the impacts on the brain are, you know, attention. Uh, there's some you know, attention issues that occur, decision-making, learning, um, responding to stress. Uh, these effects can also be passed on 
Um, we learned that, um, that sometimes, you know, our grand parents pass on traits and, and, um, you know, intergenerational trauma to us, and we can pass those on to our children. So we want to ensure that we realize the impact of trauma. And part of, part of that realization is what you're doing today, which is taking this, this brief communication, this conversation, and hopefully thinking, um, and being able to process how trauma has affected you and your loved ones. You know, also remember some common reactions uh, to being triggered. So we have the fear and anxiety, anger, sadness. You know, sometimes it's self-blame and it doesn't always get recognized as trauma when we're when we um, hear others blaming themselves. Sometimes we're like, good on you, you took responsibility. However, that can also be a reaction from trauma. So we want to be mindful of how individuals that are on a healing journey behave. So this is really positive. So let's look at some of the six domains that people operate in who are, you know, like I said, none of us, you know, I haven't met anyone that's completely healed that has experienced trauma necessarily, but there are domains that these individuals operate in and you can sense and feel those when you're around somebody who's done a lot of work in healing. Um, you feel safe. You hear them taking ownership of, of their responsibilities, their wrongs, um, and they are boundary driven in a lot of cases. Uh, they're trustworthy. They're transparent. Um, you know, you don't sense there's any shady secret stuff going on. Um, they also have a healthy support network. Uh, they approach things in a collaboration uh, way. They are, they have mutuality, so they kind of meet you where you are and work together with you, whether it's a friendship, a professional relationship, or other. Um, you'll also hear things of empowerment. You'll hear a theme of how these healthy individuals empower you and empower themselves. You'll hear their voice and their respect of others' voice. And of course, they also respect cultural identities. And so it's very important to recognize these positive uh, traits in individuals had a, that are going on that um, healing journey and um, be able to assess whether that's an individual that you would like to spend time with or not and find out where they got their help from, okay? There's also a way to respond when you hear somebody has experienced personal trauma. My philosophy doesn't necessarily have to be yours, but I put some peer support type of responses um, on the side. And so a straightforward way of honoring the trust that's placed in us is always my best practice. Uh, you know, simply thank you so much for trusting me, for sharing. Uh, that goes a long way. We don't become others fixers. We can't heal others. We can only support through their healing journey. So giving space um, is very important <clears throat> when others share with us. So one common practice is to not try to fill the silence. This was so hard for me. <laughs> I don't know if you guys are like me, but I could be in a room with five people and if nobody's talking, I suddenly feel uncomfortable. So this is stretching me. And um, But one of the things that you want to do is don't try to fill the silence. Just allow them to divulge the details that they want to share as they go. Um, always, always, always approach uh, information that's being shared with you in a non-judgmental way. What's wrong with you? Why did that occur? Uh, you know, remember and always encourage yourself and them <clears throat> with compassionate responses, not to um, induce shame. You really want to redo that 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 response. So I'm so sorry that you had that experience. And let me just add here, don't say that if it's not real for you, because 
anybody who has experienced trauma and they are sharing will know if you're not being authentic. So find your own response, but these are just simply some responses that I've placed um, for you. <clears throat> and then of course, resist re-traumatizing other individuals. This is huge. And sometimes um, I've heard this saying, and I think part of it is hurt people hurt others. And we hear it. And whenever we hear that, we as individuals who are on a journey always think of somebody else. Or you have the complete polar opposite reaction, which is, oh my God, that's so me. That's so me. And you personalize it. <laughs> and some of us have healed to a point where we're in between. But I'd like to ask somebody on the call to go ahead and read this, this slide. Can I get a volunteer? I will, Don. This is Veronica. So what Thank is, you. Re yeah, what is re-traumatization? a situation, attitude, interaction, or environment that replicates the events or dynamics of the original trauma and triggers the feelings and reactions associated with them. Re-traumatizing often is not obvious to us until we can connect how we are left feeling after the situation. Most often it is unintentional and happens with someone or something we place value on. And there's just one more um, sentence, Veronica, that I just really wanted to emphasize. Yeah, In all, it is almost always hurtful, increasing the very symptoms that we are hoping to avoid. Trauma that we experience defines how we react to others. So somebody can be bubbling into the room, happy, full of life, and say something like, I see you didn't eat all your salad for lunch, huh, and walk away. But that individual that they said that to may feel shamed by that comment. Is it that person that just bumbled, you know, happy-go-lucky, made a comment, and walk away? Is that their responsibility, how somebody that has experienced trauma um, feels when they walk away? Not necessarily. It's our internal work. It's our journey that can help us identify and take those steps into healing, regardless of who's saying what. Okay. You guys have been great. Okay. So can anybody read that cartoon that I have on the screen, the caption under it? I don't know if it's big enough for you. Do you want me to read the, the caption on the, the cartoon? The, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a new <clears throat> antidepressant. Instead of swallowing it, you throw it at anyone who appears to be having a good time. <laughs> <laughs> and so why is getting help so hard sometimes? Well, not all of us are trauma informed. So if we're leaning on individuals who are not trauma informed, even educated, it may be difficult for us to get the authentic help that we need. So there's no shame in leaning on your friends and telling your families, you know, what's going on with you. However, if we're leaning on people who are not healed and not experts in helping others heal, we may not experience the healing that we really want to experience. Um, so don't assume that somebody who has a little information about trauma can actually walk through a healing journey with you and advise you on the appropriateness of what your steps are in your trauma journey. Not necessarily, okay? So also don't assume that they may be ready that because they've experienced healing, they may be ready to hear your journey. Part of that um, process will be finding out who they are and what, it, what healing they've experienced and allowing them to tell you about their journey that they've been through. I always caution people 
when um, they're in the midst of a healing journey to not reach out and try to help others. And one of the main reasons that I caution that is because sometimes we experience our own trauma and um, we need time to heal from that. So what are some of the traps that we see that are trauma inducing? Well, poverty, um, I think it was Veronica that mentioned that, um, racism, homophobia, victim blaming, um, oh, you know, that they're responsible for what happened to them, stigma, ableism, individuals who, um, you know, have lower than um, positive expectations for individuals that have physical challenges um, and social societal violence. I grew up in the inner city of Detroit, so I experienced a lot of um, societal violence. And one of the things that we've learned to do in our work is kind of put just like you see this butterfly behind the, the bars, we kind of learn how to separate ourselves and to put those, um, you know, sometimes those dramatic and traumatic events to the side. It isn't until we go through a, a healing journey that we can understand that not only did we experience that trauma, but we also have uh, a story to tell. And part of that story is understanding who trauma affects. So I'd like to ask anybody who's on this call that would like to respond, who actually can experience trauma? I believe that would be anybody could experience trauma. <laughs> everybody. You, That's true. It is true. And how is trauma normally experienced, Candy? <laughs> How is it normally experienced? Mm -hmm. Well, it can be experienced at any, I mean, it can be physically experienced. It can be just emotionally experienced. It could be experienced anyway. Is that the right answer? That's the right answer. Essentially, <laughs> as gonna, <laughs> I'm going to answer that, it can be experienced vicariously. Oh. <laughs> It can be vicariously experienced as well, but essentially trauma can be experienced defined by the individual. Everybody's experience can be different. So sometimes we look for support and um, if we find it, it should look something like this on your screen. You know, you'll see the two gentlemen, what happened? He says, I don't know. And the gentleman says, well, how can I help? And this other individuals, I don't know. And he said, okay, I made you a nest. Do you want to come? And he's like, okay. And so he asked, does that help? And he says, yes. And and then the guy says, are you ever coming out? And he's like, no. So his friend says, okay, hang on, and gets in there with him. And that is the biggest part of the trauma journey that we get, <clears throat> excuse me, that we can learn from one another is being there and being of support. So community leaders, those of you that are leading individuals or working with other individuals, remember that ACEs are not limited to the child. And trauma that occurs after 18 obviously matters. Sometimes we're, you know, we, we think of trauma in children and we don't acknowledge what individuals over 18 go through. Historical trauma, cultural trauma, we looked at that generational, that intergenerational trauma. Um, sometimes that can impact everyone in our in our family line, in our friends, in our neighbors. Um, also being aware of individuals coping mechanisms. Look at look a little bit deeper into those four areas of responses. You'll see a lot of developed coping skills of individuals that have, have experienced trauma. Things to know. We are resilient. Okay? We are a resilient bunch of people and nothing is set in stone. You know, seven years ago, I couldn't walk upstairs. I was sleeping in a car at the state fairground. 
um, I was told I got dealt a bad hand of genes and that I would never, you know, really um, be able to heal um, amongst numerous other very, uh, um, you know, dark <laughs> um, recommendations. But nothing's set in stone. Nobody knows what the future is. And so strategies that helped me Maybe they'll help others, but maybe not. Maybe there are individuals that need to find their own strategies. And identifying and observing coping mechanisms is the very first step in healing. So I know when I start feeling upset or start feeling stressed, I realize something's happening in my environment that is impacting me and impacting the trauma that I've had, I've experienced previously. Okay. So these are the qualities that help heal. Empathy, compassion, we hear about that all the time. But what about a talking openly where you feel like what you say isn't shared with others, that you're safe? that you're able to be honest. Also, what's our responsibility in this healing journey? Awareness of who we are and what we do and how we respond, knowing your own character, being flexible, willing to learn or change. You know, willingness to emotionally connect Sometimes we are guarded and afraid. And, um, you know, if we're still in that space, you know, we have a little more healing to go. Ability to treat individuals as equals. That's that mutuality and collaboration that we talked about. Self-care, being able to take care of ourselves and doing our own emotional work. Just something that food for thought if you're always thinking of somebody else that needs this information or always thinking of somebody else that needs to improve or change their lives, I can tell you that you still have work to do. And um, it's not until we can rise up above that, that most of the time, none of us are going to do it all of the time. And I have a trigger and I have a friend that just sets me back about five years every time I <clears throat> get upset. But it's a journey. Okay. I love this picture. I don't know why I'm so drawn to it. I'm just going to, for just a few seconds, let you folks look at it for a moment. So here is the wheel of healing, rebuilding the ability to trust, an internal sense of safety through secure relationships, bearing witness to survivors' experience and emotional truths. That moves us into fostering greater capacity for emotional regulation and putting the pieces back together. Here are some just tips on how to cope with triggers if you're experiencing them. You know, we have relaxation techniques, call somebody, keep your journal, um, you know, exercise if you like doing that. Also, I always recommend in this area where it says becoming aware of your triggers, I kind of, once you become aware, it's a great um, plan to write some of those down, what your awareness is. But healing doesn't mean the damage never existed. It just means that the damage no longer controls your life. Well, okay, so that, that, was, <laughs> that was just excellent. I think everybody's a little bit spellbound because you covered so much and you started out saying, you know, this is from my lived experience, not the clinical. Well, I'm, I come from the clinical and I have my own lived experience, of course, but this uh, really is an excellent, excellent training. Um, I look forward to being able to share it with people. And I so appreciate um, your 
letting me and letting us do that. Oh, you're so welcome. You know, oftentimes when I present, as you both know, um, I present from my point of view and my life and what I've learned and try to make it relevant for others. Um, so thank you for that feedback. I would love to hear from others on this call what you thought about the presentation, if it was relevant for you, and any, any suggestions that you may have for improvements. Veronica, go ahead. Hey, um, so first of all, great, great presentation. Um, I knew some of this, but not all of it. And really being able to to pull it together um, has been very impactful for me. I think one thing that I took away from this, um, well, two things actually, is a lot of times we think we've worked through our trauma, um, but we find out we haven't, or that um, either we haven't at all, or we might be re-triggered or re-traumatized by a situation. Um, and so my, my feeling from this is that I have come to realize that sometimes we have to work through it over and over again, but to bring the hope side of this is we never really start all the way back where we were <clears throat> because each time it's almost kind of like a relapse, right? Each time we, you know, we end up back into that cycle, whatever it may be, each person is different. Um, we've taken something with us that we've learned the time before. So I don't think we ever end up all the way back where we were. Um, but yeah, I think it's really important for us to be aware that um, this is recovery and, and going through trauma and everything is, is a lifelong process. We don't just flip the switch and we're done. So thank you so much, Don. Thank you, Veronica. Got it. Okay. Hi. Uh, my name is Jeff Goldsmith. And can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Oh, good, good. <clears throat> and first of all, I enjoyed this uh, tremendously. Thank you very much. Um, and I live in Sedona and I'm a retired physician with a research interest in uh, and clinical interest in uh, depression and management of depression. And I, I just might say um, you made a comment earlier on you're not a physician so you won't go into medical problems. And you, you, you sort of did a nice correlation. And I appreciated that very much. It was stark and uh, accurate and uh, alarming. Now, as a physician, I was also a physician teacher. I spent 20 years in teaching uh, family physicians. I gotta say that um, even though um, that is so obvious as we look at it on the screen, as we get trained as family physicians, uh, we fail to integrate a person's cultural, a political, economic, et cetera, environment <clears throat> into healthcare. Yes. You your mistake. Uh, and uh, us uh, teachers, who try to do that or tried to do that usually the trainees because i i trained medical students in residence um really much more attractive in the beginning of how do you stop someone from dying in the er with blood coming out of all orifices so you you, you don't get the attention of the trainees until they're uh, comfortable with how am I going to prevent this person from dying who's in front of me? Because that's that's the fear we all have as a trainees that go into medicine is we're going to be revealed as imposters and let people die. So the, the more training you can do in the medical setting probably needs to be a little bit, a little bit later on with the more mature residents uh, that are already comfortable. They, they got the basics of how to keep someone alive. So I, I, I wouldn't de-emphasize this and I would bring it to uh, training centers. And um, I'm working actually on a project right now trying to integrate that into uh, training for quality improvement and with regard to depression. Not necessarily trauma, although trauma precedes depression. We'll, we'll get to that eventually. But um, I, th 
I, I think you downplayed a little bit too much the fact you are not a clinician. You have more wisdom than most of us clinicians have. Yay! In, in, in regard to what you said. Well, I, doctor. I just, I just wanted to say that. Thank you so much. Um, also, if, had I known you were on the um, call before I presented, I may have been even more nervous. But thank you for your wonderful feedback and the fact that you know you did acknowledge there were you know accuracy. Um, one of the things that I always am careful with, and maybe I should explain, um, as an individual, we have um, sets of audiences that we present to. And so you'll hear in, in most presentations, you'll hear me give those disclaimers, because sometimes in those audiences are individuals who perceive you as an expert or a clinician or a physician when you're talking about certain subject matters. And that's um, that can be um, harmful for them. But thank you so much for your feedback. I really appreciate it. And I'm so glad you were on the call. Thank you for giving it. I appreciate you. <laughs> You're welcome. Anybody else would like to share? Well, like what the doctor was saying, um, I think a lot of times people that are clinical or doctors have a tendency to traumatize us in the sense that they don't understand and we're re-traumatized by those interactions, even people that are very well trained clinically. Um, and they do this through labels or making assumptions um, about our behavior. And this is where peer support is so invaluable because Dawn is my peer support. She's the person that I go to. So are these two people in this room. So when I am feeling shamed or whatever, I can talk to them and they don't make a judgment, but they help normalize what I'm hearing. And it, it just, it makes it, it just, in a couple of minutes, I'm going, oh yeah, yeah, everything's okay. It's just amazing. So Don, it's been absolutely incredible listening to you. And now I'm a little, I'm scared to go to you. You're so, <laughs> so good. <laughs> um, but, but what you have shown throughout this pr presentation is having compassion for each other. And that's how we heal. And that's how we come to accept ourselves. So true. And I think that's, that's a key missing component when we work in the industry, or we are accustomed to individuals talking to us is eventually, you know, I've heard the word jaded used in, in reference to, to situations like this. But really, all it is, is just reminding ourselves that we're an empathetic, compassionate people. And, um, you know, it, it just takes that community reminding one another that our goal is to always be here as family members, you know, we have, we have to lean on one another um, to be able to support those that we love and through the through their own recovery journey and then as individuals. It's the same. We have to lean on one another to support ourselves through that recovery journey. So it's pivotal. I know we all so appreciate you taking time um, uh, to join us, and uh, you're just a real um, asset to the whole community, um, and you know, <laughs> we're, we're all here with each other, um, so thank you so much. For future events, please visit NamiYavapai.org, and for mental health resources in Arizona, visit mentalhealthresources.org. Thank you for watching.